Good morning. So we have uh, coming up seven startups um, that are focused on synthetic biology. Each one will be presenting for about five to six minutes. There, uh, there will be no Q&A. The intention is that you're going to follow up with them afterwards during the break. Uh, and they'll have uh, posters printed where you can find them. And uh, so without further ado, our first speaker is, is uh, Jeff Wager. He's CEO of Enbiotics. And Biotic was co-founded with uh, Professor James Collins, Professor of Medical Engineering and Science, and also Professor of Biological Engineering at MIT. And, and, uh, and Biotic is uh, engineering the antibiotics of tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome. And um, Biotics, as Marcus just alluded to, is an engineered antibiotics company that's founded on uh, Jim Collins' synthetic and systems biology platforms that we in-licensed. Um, um, the product focus is the antibiotic space, so it's a $40 billion market. Um, you all have heard about the crisis in antibiotics due to resistance and also bacterial tolerance. Um, we're a very partnering-driven firm given the number of platforms that we have. We did our first deal um, um, uh, with a multinational healthcare firm, a second with a pharma family office, and a third with a leading animal health company. Uh, we have multiple other partnerships in discussion, and we have also a number of uh, products that we're taking through internally as well. Here we depict the various platforms that we have in licensed or acquired, most of which, uh, except for the one at 6 p.m. down there, uh, having been in licensed from the Collins Laboratory. Uh, today I'm just going to give you a couple of examples uh, from the anti-persister platform and the engineered bacteriophage platform. So. Um, what are engineered bacteriophage? Well, first, um, natural phage are viruses that infect only um, uh, uh, bacteria. Um, uh, they've been around since the 1920s as an antibiotic modality. Uh, they were sort of pushed to the side during the antibiotic era with um, penicillins and the rest of the antibiotics that came afterwards. Uh, but they've resurged in terms of a uh, candidate for antibiotics given uh, resistance and tolerance. Um, what we're doing is we're taking uh, these uh, natural phage and we're loading them up with different kinds of payloads. Um, those payloads can be either um, biofilm di dispersing enzyme payloads or antimicrobial peptide payloads, uh, gene regulator um, payloads, um, uh, also uh, uh, antitoxin payloads either singly or in combination, and we're working uh, these payload uh, technologies uh, in parallel. Uh, this was the focus, actually, of the Elanco deal. Uh, the scope of it is confidential, but um, we have a, a number of other deals in, in negotiation based on this platform. Uh, there's a wide range of applications of this platform that are possible, uh, both therapeutic, um, animal health, agricultural, consumer, uh, and as well as industrial. So a really breadth of uh, applications. I know a number of, of the uh, members of the audience here are not from the pharma industry, so I mention that particularly. Um, the other platform th that we have that I want to talk about today is our anti-persister platform. So bacterial persisters are bacteria that are metabolically dormant. And because they're dormant, they're highly tolerant to antibiotics. They're not genetically resistant. They're just able metabolically to tolerate very high doses of antibiotics without effect. They're the leading cause of chronic recurrent infections. What we're doing is we're taking one antibiotic called tobramycin, which is the frontline therapy for the infections that cystic fibrosis patients get, and we're making it remarkably better, very, very substantially better. Um, uh, the problem with tobramycin is that the um, effect of it over time um, uh, it goes down, and this is because a increasing percentage of the bugs that are infecting a CF lung uh, become persisters. Um, it's a significant opportunity, not only in CF, but also in non-CF bronchiectasis and COPD. Um, the Collins Laboratory figured out a way to actually wake up these persisters, and this is really the basis for uh, the, the number of products that we're developing in this area. Uh, what they found was that if you gave a metabolite, a sugar, some candy that these bacteria preferred, that they would actually wake up out of their metabolically dormant state, and then um, um, certain antibiotics like aminoglycosides, which tobramycin is a, a member of, um, could be actively transported into the cell and, 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 and kill it. 
So with that, what we did is we took a combination of tobramycin and screened a whole bunch of different metabolites. The, the, the one that worked best was fumarate. Um, and we have developed that so far um, in a number of uh, CF clinical isolates across a number of conditions designed to mimic the infected CF lung. Uh, the, um, the data here that I'm showing down at the bottom is just one of um, uh, literally 30, 40 different um, uh, studies that we've done with the combination. Uh, this one's particularly interesting because um, biofilms are particularly uh, pathologic in the CF lung, and we're able in, in, in this experiment to show that we can actually eradicate them. Um, we are seeking partners for not only EBX01 development, that tobramycin potentiator, but also uh, for our engineered um, uh, phage platform broadly, and we would welcome um, discussions after the um, conference. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Our next speaker is Narendra Maheshri, senior biological engineer at Ginkgo Bioworks. Ginkgo was uh, co-founded by five MIT PhDs across bi uh, biological engineering, computer science, artificial intelligence, and synthetic biology. Um, and Ginkgo is a computer-aided foundry for engineering organisms and also a Stex25 startup. Thank you. Um, so uh, today what I, what I really like to talk about is an emerging trend uh, we think at Ginkgo is happening in the biotech industry. And that is that the cost of uh, bioengineering is, is dropping so dramatically that biotech is now entering into uh, industries that traditionally haven't seen, you know, biotech. So, you, you know, how, how can that happen? So at Ginkgo, we think of ourselves as the organism company or the organism design company. And in essence, we think about designing organisms as writing DNA code, right? So if you have the ability to read DNA and write DNA, uh, then you can start programming biology. If you can program biology, you can do design, right? And so we think that the design of biology is going to enter a lot of different markets, uh, not just, let's say, traditional pharma, biotech, and so you're going to see products like iPhones, whatnot, coming out of biology. And so that's, you know, so why is this the case? Why do we think that's the case? And we think there are three reasons for this, right? Uh, two of them have to do with the cost of reading and writing DNA. So if you look at the cost of reading DNA, d DNA sequencing costs have gone down dramatically. They've gone down faster than, than Moore's law. Uh, and a lot of folks have exploited that. But also the cost of writing DNA uh, has also gone down. You know, when I... When I was here at MIT as a professor, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to uh, buy a DNA. It was $5 a base to synthesize DNA. Now it's under 10 cents. So these two reasons combined with um, you know, the fact of having infrastructure to actually deal with all this synthesized DNA. Ginkgo does about 30 to 35% of the world's synthesized DNA. And that's 600 million base pairs. So you really need, you know, how, actually designing, how do you design 600 million base pairs to do something useful? That's something we've been working on for the last three, four years. And so, you know, we've done so much of it that we've actually acquired uh, a Boston-based DNA synthesis provider, Gen9. Uh, but you have those two things, reading and writing DNA, and then you also have to have a, a, a manufacturing platform to actually design, take your design prototypes and build and test them. And so that's what Ginkgo's foundries are about. I don't have time to talk about Ginkgo's foundries uh, too much today, but the idea is to centralize all the common biological operations you do in building and testing organisms and attain scale and attain lower costs. That's what it looks like today. If you have time, even this uh, afternoon, come, come by Ginkgo. We're local, 160 uh, people out in the seaport, and, and I can show you very open about showing what the foundry looks like. When you're doing manufacturing like this, you can track what's happening. And so in the last two years, our output has increased 10x. But it's not just, you know, we hired more people, we have some funding. Uh, the efficiency has also gone up, right? So on a per person basis, we've gone up 7x. So this sort of is, showing, is starting to validate our hypothesis that if you do this sort of thing, you lower costs. And so what do you want to do with this? We're really interested in consumer biotech. This is a sneaker, Adidas. Um, sneaker, which is genetically engineered components, right? And you can see the product launch looks like a, a tech product launch. It doesn't look like a FDA drug launch, right? Uh, here's another company, our friends, Bolt Threads. They've made a, uh, using yeast, they spun spider silk uh, to make ties. So, so this, the future is actually now. When I talk about synthetic biology going into consumer biotech, it already is. 
And a lot of that's happening through partnerships. Here's three different uh, um, biotech companies that are partnering with larger apparel companies. Uh, you may have heard of this uh, movement to replace animal, uh, animal-based dry foods, you know, with uh, plant-derived or microbial-derived foods, and so that's a that's a hot thing. The, this Impossible Burger, I don't know, I, I've had it. You know, the the blood is from uh, the heme in the blood is engineered from yeast, right? So that this is how Synbio is getting in there. We're, we're playing in a lot of spaces. We're about to announce a major deal in pharma to really think about the plant microbiome and, and think about root colonization, how you can improve uh, um, uh, plant crop yields. So we've, you know, to date partnered with a, a whole bunch of different companies um, across a variety of industries. Uh, and, and we're really looking for partners who, you know, want to understand the technology. Who, we want the partners to do what they do well, and we want to see where we can come in uh, to help them. So that's really how uh, we look at these, uh, these partnerships. And again, even if you think your industry has nothing, you know, has nothing in common with synthetic biology, you know, that's where we are uh, there to say, hey, maybe there actually is an opportunity. Um, so I'll, I'll leave with this, again, back to the broader industry trend. If you look at uh, last year, it was about a billion dollars of venture uh, that went into synthetic biology for non-pharma type applications, right? So the, the industry trend is, definitely moving in that way. There are folks, you know, that, that think this will be disruptive. So here, um, you know, the industry is being compared to the Ubers and the Airbnbs. It's looking more like tech um, than, let's say, traditional biotech. You know, that said, we think a lot of the things we've done will apply uh, in, in pharma, for example. And so we're starting to do our first partnerships in, in, in that space uh, also. All right. So with that, um, please, if you want to talk more about your particular industry and how synthetic biology might apply, Come email me, talk to me afterwards. Look forward to it. Thank you. All right, next up is Christine Santos, CTO of Manus Bio. She holds a PhD from MIT in chemical engineering. The company was co-founded um, with the professor, the Dow Professor of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at MIT. Manus Bio has created a new process for chemical manufacturing. So good morning, my name is Christine Santos. I'm the CTO of Manus Bio and a PhD graduate of the Chemical Engineering Department at MIT. Uh, I'm joined on the leadership team by our CEO and co-founder, Aji Paril, who was an MIT Research Fellow in Chemical Engineering, uh, as well as Jeff Anderson, our Chief Operating Officer, who was a graduate of the MIT Sloan School of Management. So Manus Bio is a five-year-old startup company that was founded based on technology that was developed in the lab of our co-founder, Greg Stephanopoulos, and actually had its early roots through partnering initiatives that were organized through the MIT ILP. And our mission at Manus Bio is to reinvent chemical manufacturing using biotechnology. So as you may know, the bio-based production of chemicals has seen significant advances over the last several years in large part due to advances in and the convergence of technologies in DNA synthesis, DNA sequencing, omics-based technologies, and genome editing. And bio-based sourcing has a number of advantages. So, you know, first of all, it enables simplification of what were traditionally um, multiple discrete unit operations into a single biological process. Uh, it affords sustainability by decreasing our reliance on petrochemical-based resources. And finally, it grants access to many types of chemistries, from simpler chemical building blocks all the way to much more complex molecules with chirality or stereochemistries, which can only be accessed through biology. And it's this last advantage in particular that has been a real focal point for our work at Manus Bio and has allowed us to innovate on chemical sourcing across a number of multi-billion dollar industries. So at Manus Bio, we specialize in the production of the largest and the most complex group of natural products called terpenoids. There are more than 60,000 structurally diverse chemical members, many of which have a range of biological activities uh, with a number of uh, industrially relevant applications. So our process is as follows. You know, once we identify uh, ingredients of interest, we first elucidate the plant natural product pathway. We recreate them in microbes and then optimize the cellular metabolism and the bioprocess in order to enable commercial levels of terpenoid production. From there, we're able to transfer these processes into existing large-scale manufacturing facilities, where we're now able to convert low-value inputs such as sugar 
into high value ingredients which we use in our daily lives. So some examples include flavors, fragrances and sweeteners, uh, cosmetic active ingredients as well as agricultural chemicals such as biopesticides. So at Manus Bio, we're able to manufacture ingredients at a significantly lower production cost uh, with much fewer land resources and at the quality and the scale that's required for industrial use. So our technology platform has really two important elements. Um, the first in the middle is an engineering framework that really combines three core disciplines, protein engineering, metabolic engineering, and systems biology to enable us to develop commercial strains very quickly and efficiently. And so very briefly, we use protein engineering to take these plant-native enzymes and improve their activities and performance in a microbial host. We then use metabolic engineering to optimize the cell's metabolism to enable very high levels of terpenoid production. And finally, we layer in systems biology, an omics-based characterization to very quickly elucidate bottlenecks in the pathways and guide our engineering approaches. The second important element is a universal terpenoid chassis that produces a common terpenoid precursor at near theoretical yields. And so what we're able to do is pair these two elements, the universal chassis along with our engineering framework and able to adapt our platform to access a variety of novel ingredients very quickly, efficiently, and at low cost. And this is a proven platform. You know, we're in the process of scaling up our first product and are set to launch next year uh, through a long-standing collaboration with an industrial partner. And we have many other products in the pipeline to follow soon thereafter. So we're interested in working with companies who are looking for new sources of natural products. And this can take many different forms, uh, from drop-in replacements for existing ingredients, uh, to novel ingredients with high-performing attributes, uh, to chemical scaffolds that are available for further diversification, or large natural product libraries that can be used for bioactivity screening. So if any of these applications are of interest to you, um, please feel free to contact me, and I'd love to discuss opportunities for collaboration. Thank you. The next speaker is Andrew Warren, founding scientist and product development lead at Glimpse Bio. He holds a PhD in medical engineering and medical physics from MIT. A Glimpse was co-founded by Professor Sanjita Bhatia, professor of health sciences and technology, and professor, also professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Glimpse is creating a non-invasive and predictive mechanism for monitoring disease. Hey, good morning. So Glimpse Bio, again, is interested in, instead of looking at normal biomarkers, developing our own synthetic biomarkers from scratch. So as engineers, we're interested in looking at parts of biology that are otherwise very difficult to read out. We can build uh, sensors that go into the body and sense these disease processes and give us very rich information. So we're interested in developing that platform. So again, with normal biomarkers, what you're reliant on is what the body's providing for you. And oftentimes, you're just looking at one thing, so your information isn't very rich. So finally, you're looking at things that are in the blood. So there are a lot of weaknesses with existing biomarkers. And what we're excited to do is, as engineers, again, approach this platform from a different angle. So what we can do is look at diseases that have certain types of activities and read out how these uh, activities affect disease. So looking specifically at liver disease, which I'll talk about today, uh, you can read out the activity of proteases, which drive this forward, and look at a kinetic read of what's going on with the disease states. So what we do is we can engineer slides that work not too well. Uh, but basically, we can build multiplex things that give us a lot of rich information about uh, disease states at once, instead of just looking at one thing at a time. Uh, we can tailor make these different particles so that they address different parts of disease, rather than just giving you what uh, the body provides as easily accessible. And finally, we can make it so it's easier to use these. So we would inject this, and it would produce a readout in the urine. So it's something that's really reliable and easy to deal with. So I'll give you an example of what we're developing as our main product. And this is a platform, so I'll go over a lot of the other things that we're interested in as a company. Um, but right now, we're focusing on liver disease. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NASH and NAFLD are projected to be the leading cause of liver transplant by 2020. So these are diseases that are affecting a lot of people, are very difficult to diagnose, and only a fraction of patients are progressing to the dangerous state of disease. So right now they're very poor 
uh, diagnostic alternatives. And what we're interested in doing is building up a platform that gives us very rich information on not only who has the disease, but who's moving forward with the disease and give uh, new things that biology can't provide us right now. So the way we uh, achieve this is by putting together sensors for protease activity. So we can design these from the ground up with three different parts. So from right to left, we have a carrier that takes these upon injection to the liver so we can interrogate the activity. Uh, things that move the disease forward, proteases, uh, tear up these substrates that we put in, and we can design many different types of these at once. So we can get a readout of this by those barcodes on the very left-hand side. So we can address many different proteases at once that give us information on disease state that'll tell us where a patient is, if they're likely to progress, and if they're on treatment, if they're moving back and regressing with disease. So we can manufacture these using simple uh, solid phase peptide synthesis, manufacture these as a sort of simple drug that's um, non-toxic. We can put them together as a cocktail and inject them into patients. So what happens after you inject these is they go to the liver, they interact with this disease state and give you kinetic information on what's happening. So they're small and they filter into the urine at that point and we can give you quantitative information on your disease state. So this works for a lot of different things, not just uh, liver disease. I've sort of described the top part of this axis, but we think it's a platform. And you can change different pieces for each one. So you can change the delivery modality instead of injecting, so you can target the liver or other organs. You can imagine an inhalable version that goes to the lungs. Or you could imagine a subcutaneous depot that delivers over time and allows you to monitor something like clotting. Uh, for liver fibrosis, that's something we're excited about because it's a lot of patients. It's very difficult to address right now. Um, and there are, um, I think, a really good opportunities for us to address new parts of the biology. You can address different things like lung cancer, though, and thrombosis, which we've shown in a handful of papers. And finally, you know, we're showing you the fancy uh, high-dimensional version of this uh, platform right now, but we have a lot of different techniques for understanding in very simple ways, similar to a pregnancy test. You can imagine doing these tests anywhere in the world without relying on uh, expensive clinical infrastructure. So we think uh, moving forward, we're outlining the top part of this again, but we think there are a lot of different applications for the Glimpse biotechnology, and that's something we'd love to discuss with other people today. So in summary, we're trying to advance what we think is a disruptive and exciting platform to the clinic. Uh, right now, we've tested this in many different diseases and published it on many of these from the Koch Institute, Sangeeta Bhatia's lab, where I did my PhD. And we have some, I think, uh, exciting blocking patents for this. Uh, we have a great team, and our lead program is in NASH, so we're moving forward on that. But we have a lot of exciting uh, secondary things that I'm happy to talk about later on. So what we're trying to do is establish this as a pipeline, so something we can move forward through rapidly for other diseases. And we have follow-on programs in uh, liver cancer. And so right now what we're doing is finalizing our formulation, and we're hoping to move into human studies sometime around the end of 2018. So I think there are a lot of exciting collaboration opportunities. Uh, from design and formulation of our drugs to looking to new diseases uh, and understanding the, what a human proof of concept would look like. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be standing right back there uh, if anyone has questions. Thank you. All right, next speaker is Natalie Artsy, co-founder of Biodevec. Uh, she's also a research scientist at the Edelman Lab. And uh, Professor Edelman was, is one of the co-founders. He's a professor of health sciences and technology at MIT, and also director of the Harvard MIT Biomedical Engineering Center. Biodevec is making biocompatible adhesive materials. Good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to talk with you about Biodevec. Devec is a Hebrew word for adhesive or glue. Together with Eleazar Edelman, we are looking to re revolutionize the field of wound closure. BioDevec designs the next generation biocompatible tuning, tunable and reversible adhesive materials. Anastomotic leak or leakage from internal surgeries is a dangerous and costly complication. And despite the advancement in material science and understanding of tissue biology, we are still using ancient techniques to uh, prevent leakage or close uh, uh, the wounds. And these are sutures or staples. And you can see in the bottom left uh, image a colon that's been resected and now being put together close by a suture. Or on the right side, a scheme of uh, uh, vessels that are connected now to a vascular graft and in all of those cases, for gastrointestinal tract uh, uh, surgery, cardiovascular 
vascular surgery or even tumor resection, we see a huge problem of leakage of either blood content because of severe bleeding or gut content that will result in inflammation, peritonitis, sepsis, and then uh, increase the morbidity uh, of patients. What we seek to do is to design an adhesive material that can be applied in the area of re resection or incision and in that way prevent leakage, uh, stabilize the wound and enhance, to, uh, enhance wound healing. So the opportunity is huge, but the problem is that an astomotic leak from the gastrointestinal tract following resection uh, results in many complications and poor patient outcomes. But the commercially available materials, unfortunately, are a, a, a very limited because they force the clinicians to decide between two critical measurements that we want to have in every glue, which is the adhesion strength, how strong the material will adhere to the tissue because this is a glue, and biocompatibility. Of course, we don't want our material to be toxic. So uh, what we see is that fibrin glue that is used uh, internally is very biocompatible, but you can see in the graph the load or the force that we need to apply in order to remove or detach this material from the tissue, it's very low. On the other hand, cyanoacrylate is very strong and adheres very fiercely to the tissue, but it is toxic. So this is why adhesive materials that have such huge potential have actually very limited market penetration because they are suboptimal. So we have a huge opportunity here, and BioDevec designed a, a unique solution. Our material that you can see in green can be applied to many different tissues, and you can see in red here the heart, the lung, the liver, or the udino, which is part of the small intestine. Our material can sense the environment and provide the right number of groups to interact with the tissue. It is a strong material that can seal the suture line and promote healing. We have a dual chamber syringe that uh, delivers two components uh, materials, uh, two synthetic polymers. When they meet with each other, they would quickly form a solid gel that will also interact with the tissue to form the adhesion strengths. We also have a kit that we can use to test tissue state and uh, also inform us on the best formulation for each case. So we, what we, BioDevic really focused on as a first indication is preventing an astomotic leak or leakage from the uh, gastrointestinal tract. If you can uh, uh, see here the type of operations that are there, the incidence of leak and the number of surgeries per year in the US, you can appreciate that they, uh, uh, they, there are about 600,000 GI gastrointestinal related operations that have up to 30 or 40 percent leakage, uh, which results in huge complications. We actually talked with a, a surgeon here, the MGH, who said that uh, uh, decreasing the incidence of uh, leak would be amazing, potential, particularly for cancer patients. And we were very interested in that. And apparently, for cancer patients, when there is a colon, uh, the tumor in the colon, for example, and you resect the, the, the tumor and a piece of the colon, you now bring the two pieces together. When there is leakage, those cancer patients cannot get their chemotherapy or radiation treatment. So it really delays the well-needed treatment for those patients that put them in even a higher risk. This also has economic implications. If we can look only at uh, uh, one procedure, gastric bypass, you can see that without leak, it costs about 40K and with leak, 140K because of uh, longer hospitalization, additional procedures, including second surgery uh, in some cases. So you can see that per procedure, we can save $100,000 and there are only in the GI tract 600,000 operations a year. So this really represents a huge opportunity. So what BioDevic is looking for is for strategic partners. In our pipeline, we have not only the internal adhesive that I just mentioned that can be applied for many different applications, organs, and surgeries for patients from different diseases, but also we have a topical adhesive for the skin and a reversible adhesive solution that is used uh, in acute uh, uh, incidents uh, because we want to apply material sometimes to stop the blood, for example, and then when we get to the hospital and those patients need to get uh, additional treatment, we want to be able to dissolve the, the adhesive very easily without peeling it and creating an additional wound. So we have all of these internal, topical, and reversible technologies in BioDevic. 
And we're looking for partners uh, that have a proven, proven ability uh, to um, take uh, materials to uh, the market and uh, design with us additional applications uh, for our materials. But this is also a conference about synthetic biology. So I just would like to mention that we've already uh, had uh, great applications for this material for drug delivery. In my lab at Harvard, we use this adhesive material for local delivery of a range of therapeutics from small molecules to nucleotides and also synthetic medically engineered uh, therapeutic molecules. Uh, so we are very excited about all the opportunities that BioDevec uh, has to uh, provide and we'll be happy to discuss with you further uh, later on. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. All right, next speaker is uh, Alec Nielsen, co-founder of Asimov. Um, he holds a PhD in biological engineering from MIT. Asimov was co-founded with Professor Voigt from the Department of Biological Engineering, and they're making a programming language for living cells. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, we're a brand new synthetic biology startup. Uh, we incorporated a few months ago. Um, my name's Alec, I'm a co-founder. As Marcus just mentioned, just got my PhD from Biological Engineering. Um, I have two MIT-affiliated co-founders. My thesis advisor, Professor Chris Voigt, He's a synthetic biology pioneer. He's co-director of the Syn Bio Center. Hundreds of papers and patents. And a classmate, Raja, who also just got his PhD from bioengineering. So our company's name is Asimov, named after the very prolific science fiction author who wrote some of his most interesting ideas about the future of computation. And you'll see why that's relevant in a second. So everywhere you look in nature, cells are performing biochemical computation, remarkable feats of computation. And so what I'm showing on this slide is an artistic rendering of a cross-section of a bacterium. And so you can see the DNA in yellow and the gene product surrounding it. And despite the chaotic molecular milieu appearance of this, it's actually performing very coordinated and sophisticated computation. And in nature, uh, cell computation is used to do pattern formation, that is to self-organize into spatial uh, patterns. Um, cells communicate with one another to perform division of labor. Cells navigate their environment to find food. And even mundane things like allocating resources inside the cell, doing housekeeping, actually has an insane amount of information processing underlying it. And so literally everywhere, everywhere you look in nature, there's cell computation going on. Every material that we source from nature, every single drug, your entire body, tissues and organs patterned is through genetic circuits, through biochemical computation. And this is in stark contrast to biotechnology, where the status quo is constant gene overexpression. We're not exploiting this ability of cells to perform sophisticated computation. And we truly believe that the future of biotechnology will be much more advanced in all of the big areas from manufacturing to health and agriculture. If we could precisely program cells to sense and respond to their environment and their cell state, it would open up entirely new applications um, to make products that are currently inaccessible through synthetic chemistry, the ability to augment the human mind, the gut, our immune systems, and to program things like plant pests, soil bacteria to share in metabolism, and even the idea of engineering smart plants that could sense and respond to climate change conditions. And it's not for lack of trying. People have been building genetic circuits for about 20 years. It's just really, really hard. And so um, our approach to start to tackle this problem of how you would reliably program cells um, I helped develop over my PhD. We call it a programming language for living cells. There's a lot going on under the hood, so I'm just gonna breeze through it really quick. But here's how it works. Um, a cell designer can input a cell specification uh, using a high-level programming language. The software then performs a series of logic synthesis steps and then uses a library of modular genetics to then map to a genetic circuit. We can perform biophysical simulations, uh, cell to cell population level gene expression simulations, and we can map this to DNA. And ultimately, you can turn this into a sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. So at a high level, it's a genetic compiler that allows you to input a cell specification and get a DNA sequence out. Unless you think this is purely in software, in vaporware, in the real world, we've actually used this to build some really interesting things. Synthetic cell checkpoint circuits that can make decisions, um, metabolic control circuits, um, dynamic memory that can be read and written stably inside the cell, and some really complex cell patterning. And so if you plot the complexity of engineered genetic circuits over the past 20 years, you can see that the complexity is growing exponentially, where complexity is something like the number of moving parts inside a cell. And so what I'm circling here 
our genetic circuit examples that we've built using our platform, we really do think we've reached the era of software automation where you require computer aided design to build things of a certain complexity or precision. And so our first applications are using our platform to develop, develop genetic circuits for partners in biopharma and manufacturing. So if either of those areas are interesting to you or your company, please talk to us and we can tell you a bit more about what we're working on. We're also continuing to build out the platform for additional cell types and additional types of cell computation. And so what we're really looking for are, they fall into three buckets. Uh, there's platform partnerships, so we'd love to develop applications and platforms that are useful to others. Um, at the same time, the hypotheses we have for interesting applications, um, there are undoubtedly many other applications that we've yet to discover. So we'd love to talk to people about other potential interesting applications. And then lastly is field data. If there is something you've been trying to do in biotechnology and haven't been able to do it, we'd love to get our hands on things like transcriptomic data, ribosome profiling, and other failure modes so that we can try to engineer a solution. So with that, thank you. Our final speaker is Natalie Coldell, Executive Director of BioBuilder Educational Foundation and also instructor at MIT in the Department of Biological Engineering. BioBuilder is building, uh, is creating the model for tomorrow's science education. All right, good morning. Good morning. What, what an amazing array of really phenomenal new uh, applications for synthetic biology and, and areas in which they can be applied. I, I really think that there has never been a more exciting time to be in the field of uh, engineering or science. And the work that we're doing up at the university level and in companies, uh, I think, uh, is just phenomenal. And so um, particularly frustrating then may be that the way we teach our students about biology and about engineering has, to a first approximation, not changed in maybe 50 years, right? We still teach them to memorize things. We still teach them that uh, if they can tell us what we already know, then they are doing a good job uh, as future scientists. And so um, I think that uh, it is to our peril that we allow that to continue to happen. And um, I have started a nonprofit organization called BioBuilder Educational Foundation that really tries to bridge that gap, the work that we're doing at the university level and in companies, and tries to bring it to a broader community, in particular high school students and their teachers. Um, the tagline that we have on our website is something like bringing tomorrow's science to today's classrooms, but it's been pointed out that actually if we could even bring today's science into today's classrooms, that might be a real win. Um, the work that we have is uh, collected from my teaching within the Department of Biological Engineering at MIT. Um, I am a scientist by training, but I saw that the, taking the lens of engineering to learn life science is really a very powerful way to learn and to teach. And so uh, the work that I've been doing is collected on the BioBuilder website. It has also been collected in a textbook that O'Reilly published uh, a little, uh, just over a year ago. Um, some of the experiments that we offer to the broadest of communities is this one, oh, that smell in which normally stinky smelling bacteria are uh, challenged with, uh, to make them smell sweet like bananas, and I received pictures uh, through my Twitter feed um, from students doing this work uh, in Tingsboro, Massachusetts and as far away as Taipei, Taiwan. Um, we have BioBuilder teachers and classrooms in almost every state in America. We've done pre and post assessment on the work that we do and see gains in engagement and understanding of um, uh, the synthetic biology and our operating budget over the last, uh, has more than doubled every couple of years. Um, the real uh, impact of our work, though, comes from testimonials like this teacher who was winning an award and called out BioBuilder and saying that this is the work that changes her students' lives. Um, the teachers are the ones that have developed and deliver the content for BioBuilder, and some of them have adapted BioBuilder to reach middle school students through the BioBuilder Junior program. They also deliver the BioBuilder content through an after-school club called uh, the BioBuilder Club, which runs sort of like a first robotics club around the nation and around the world every year. And and some of the uh, partners that we have in this endeavor are listed on this slide. As a local effort, we also um, run an apprenticeship program in which we take uh, students from under-resourced schools and who self-identify as economically disadvantaged, and we give them eight weeks of training in preparation for a summer internship that would be paid in a company or in an academic lab. And again, some of the partners that we have in that program are listed on this slide as well. 
Some of the newest and most exciting work that we have is in uh, opening a learning lab, a physical space for actually teaching BioBuilder content to students, teachers, and community members. It is just down the street in a uh, location called Lab Central. Um, and we are uh, really all about community engagement and outreach into uh, the broadest of communities. Um, these were our aspirations. We built, uh, we designed a classroom and a, a teaching laboratory for uh, Lab Central as they open their second floor. And uh, today, uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, we opened the space. Um, the classroom is to the left, and this is a, a quick shot of the the lab that we have built. Um, so uh, as we grow and as we um, sort of try to reach more and more people through the work that we do, um, we are looking for companies to partner with us uh, in a handful of things. And if any of these next handful of things are of interest to you, I would love to talk to you afterwards. We are particularly looking for uh, help with service, so uh, expanding our board of directors as well as volunteers for our teaching program, uh, sponsoring of our programs like the apprenticeship or the BioBuilder Club, as well as the special events like the uh, graduation events that we hold for our students. Um, we desperately need uh, operational support and capacity building um, because uh, we are still a small organization, although we've existed for five years. There's only a handful of us doing this work. Um, workforce development ideas, so internships, placements for our students. If you are a synthetic biology company or a company interested in synthetic biology, we have students who are trained in this way and would love to work with you on that. Um, and then raising awareness. I think we are one of the best kept secrets here <laughs> about synthetic biology and about teaching. So uh, if you have um, particular talent or capacity in social media or press releases, things like that, um, I would love to talk with you about getting further involved. Um, my contact information is on the last slide, and uh, thank you so much. So I think I can make the audience a promise. This is not going to remain a best kept secret for very long. It seems to me that you know we've gone through uh, major breakthroughs in antibiotics. We've looked at synthetic biology across a multitude of industries, including apparel and some crazy things that um, I did not know that um, certainly that Ginkgo was working on. We've looked at plants. We looked at disease. We've looked at use cases in ad adhesives. And we have even discovered that there's a new operating system and a platform and a computer language for designing cells. And we have looked at the educational implications. So here's my challenge to you. This was the easy part. Now we have announced it as a break. But my challenge to you is this. We have 15 minutes. If you walk out of here and come back and sit down here and you have not met someone exciting that you at least want to partner with, I would posit that this has been a waste of your time. You have 15 minutes to get to work. <laughs> I expect results. <laughs> Come back here in 15 minutes. We have some very, very exciting speakers, notably um, you know, Jim Collins, who's transforming this field. Uh, we have some market reports from a company that hasn't yet been introduced that just was uh, uh, launching on NASDAQ uh, less than 10 days ago. Uh, we have a very, very exciting panel debate. So please enjoy the break. Don't drink too much coffee.